Thank you so much. And good afternoon. It really is a pleasure to welcome you all to Glasgow Caledonian University and such a privilege for me to introduce our speaker this afternoon, the remarkable Dr. Mark Miller. Through our Captains of Industry series, we bring industry leaders who are experts in their field to the university. People with the power to inspire our graduates, students, and the wider GCU community. And I know today's speaker will do just that because he's a global superstar in his profession. Mark Miller is indisputably one of the most significant writers of comic books and graphic novels today. As writer of Wanted, Kick-Ass, Kingsman, The Secret Service, and many, many more, he is much sought after in Hollywood and his work has been adapted into blockbuster films starring some of the world's most famous actors such as Angelina Jolie, Morgan Freeman, Nicolas Cage and the frankly rather gorgeous Colin Firth. Mark has been an executive producer on all of his films and he's worked as a creative consultant to Fox Studios and he sold his comic book empire Miller World to Netflix in 2017 and then became president of Netflix's Miller, Wor Miller World division. But Mark grew up in the townhead, townhead area of Coatbridge, just outside of the city of Glasgow. And Mark was academically gifted and successful while studying at St Ambrose High in Coatbridge. But it was comics that were his true passion from a very early age. After achieving such great success in his career in 2018, along with his wife, Lucy, he established the Miller Foundation, a chari charitable trust with the primary focus of redeveloping and giving back to the townhead community. So we are really ever so proud to count Mark among our esteemed honorary graduate community after he was awarded an honorary Doctor of Letters in 2012 in recognition of his truly outstanding and groundbreaking contribution to the creative arts. And in 2013, he was awarded an MBE from the Queen for services to film and literature. His career has been defined by his uncanny ability to combine his extraordinary imagination with a keen commercial acumen and the results speak for themselves. So without further ado, I'm delighted to hand over now to Dr. Ben McConville, who will facilitate today's conversation with Mark. Over to you, Ben. Thanks very much, Principal. Um, and, and welcome, Mark. Hello. Hello Thanks for having me. <laughs> We're really delighted to have you back. It feels like there's an old friend back in the building. Uh, and it's just a shame we're doing it in these circumstances rather than in person as well. Um, so without further ado, I think we'll, you know, just move into some questions. I'll have questions for about half an hour and then there'll be some, uh, an opportunity for some questions from, from the audience and some right. questions that have already been submitted, if that's all right. Yeah. But uh, because the audience is, you know, uh, graduates and recent graduates and, 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 and students at Glasgow Caledonian University, I think it would be useful to just start with the idea of how you got into the business. What, what was it that, that drove you and how did you do it? How did you scale the walls as they might seem to some of our students? Well, it's funny, I couldn't imagine doing anything else my entire life. Like this is all I ever wanted to do, which is great. You know, it's, it's the only skill I have, which is, which is something that I can't drive. I can't, I can't do anything else really, you know? Um, so I was lucky that I managed to get a job doing this. But when, I, when we go through old boxes in the house, we find like little comics that I made when I was five and six years old, you know? So it's kind of like David Beckham when he was two, was always kicking a ball around. I was always drawing a little picture of Spider-Man and having him fight Batman or something, you know? So so I, I knew there was no alternative. And it's weird because living in the West of Scotland in a small town, it was really far away from Hollywood and far away from publishing in New York. But I just always had this weird feeling it would work out. And I guess if I'd been born 30 years earlier, I'd have had to move to, to New York and be in that area to work at Marvel or whatever, as everybody did back in those days. But I was really lucky that technology kind of caught up with me and you could live anywhere. So you, all you need to do is hit send and you, you, can, you can be anywhere sending in your scripts. So um, yeah, I mean, it's just so, so much luck, including when I was born, all that kind of stuff. That's good. And let's talk a little bit about the creative process. I want to get dig a little bit deeper into writing in a little minute, because I think that's important. 
and 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 uh, and you know the writing is the kind of like the basis of all creativity is an interesting kind of idea but just start a little bit with the creative process you do a lot of collaboration with uh, illustrators and, and and artists but where do they where do the, uh, the the ideas start what's the what's the creative process um there's a sort of pre-netflix answers to that question and a post-netflix answer you know so so where my my day is now since I sold the company in um, August 2017. And what I do now is I create the shows or the movies first. And what I do is I sit usually for two weeks. It usually takes me about two weeks to come up with a franchise. So I'll sit for two weeks every day and just treat it like a job. I'll start at 8 a.m. on a Monday and I'll sit and I'll draw and I'll paint and I'll work out designs and things like that. I sit, I sit and plan things out. And it might go nowhere for about eight days. And then the final couple of days, it all starts clicking together. But I think of scenes, I just put these scenes together and everything, then I work it all out as a synopsis and so on, and then I, I hand it into the company and we start looking at directors and showrunners and so on. Prior to that, for most of my career, um, things like Kingsman, um, Jupiter's Legacy, the new thing we're doing just now, um, Wanted and Kick-Ass, that it was a comic book first that then we turned into a movie. You know, I kind of reverse engineer it now, where because I'm at Netflix, I, I create them in-house now. Whereas in the old days, what I used to do was do a comic and then I would shop the comic around the studios in Hollywood. Um, but it was the same thing, sitting for two weeks, sitting doodling and trying to come up with something. So I guess it sounds kind of scary, you know, when you think about it, to think, oh yeah, I'll come up with like a massive franchise. I'll give myself two weeks, you know, and, and it's almost like a production line, isn't it? You know, where you, but I, I sort of think of all creative arts a bit like that as well, you know, because I do think it's so self-indulgent to actually sort of think, well, I need two years to come up with this idea. You know that if if you if you were a joiner, you wouldn't say, "Oh, I have to wait. before I build this table, I need to wait for inspiration to hit me." You know, you you just yeah. do the time. You you sit there all day and treat it like a job, and then it usually works out. Yeah, and do you find the routine really works in terms of just keeping that discipline enables you to uh, think I'll, I'll get there, or do yeah. you have that moment in this? You know, when you get to day seven, it's not day eight yet. Do you start having some kind of crisis of confidence and thinking, "Oh my God, I'm never going to get this done." Do you have that kind of feeling or do you just stick to the routine? You know, I, I just stick to it. I just know it'll be okay. In the, in the same way that, like I say, if if I, if I was a joiner, I wouldn't actually think, oh my God, this, this table is never going to happen. You know, this cabinet will it can't be built. All I do is I think, okay, I have to refine this and just make it work and, and just treat it like a craft. So I just sit and, and really focus hard. And even stuff that I've done Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, if, if, if it's not appropriate for that project, I can sometimes bank it and shove it so I'm thinking, that's a good couple of wee scenes, that would work for something else. And I just put them in a notepad, stick them in a, a different place and come back to them in 14 weeks time when I'm starting a new project, you know? So it's weird, everything's kind of useful, even notes that I did in 2012 or something will show up again in 2019 and that scene will appear in something. You, you just can't help it. But, um, but I, I am obsessed with routines though, you know, like I think all writers are like this where you always kind of try and come up with something, some cool way to, to work that'll make you a bit more efficient. Or to, you know, you hear what other people do. Like I remember being blown away when I heard that Stephen King only worked four hours a day. He worked out every single day of the year, 365 days a year, but only four hours a day. And I was like, that's really fascinating, you know? So I, I, I tried things where, um, like just now I'm doing a crazy one that I invented myself and a lot of my pals are actually copying this and it's actually really fun. But I get up early, seven o'clock I go to the gym um, and I do 20 minutes weightlifting, just really go for it for 20 minutes. And then I give myself a 90 second cold shower, right? This sounds so Spartan, but I go into like a really cold shower just to get myself crazy, you know, have some breakfast, start writing at eight, but I sit a beer in the fridge, you know, for four o'clock and that's my 4 p.m. reward. I know that no matter how tired I am during the day or how much a plot isn't coming together, there is a wee reward at four o'clock and it's a beer, you know, so like, uh, you know, as, as long as you're not 10, follow this advice, it's, it's working out good. <laughs> Right, so that means that we are now currently drink in your in your drinking beer time. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> apologies, apologies. I'll make up for it tonight. I'll make up. Good. Listen, let's let's move on a little bit to the craft of writing because you know we have our MATV fiction writing masters here at uh, at Cali, and uh, there's quite a few of our students and graduates in the in in the audience today, and uh, you know they're they're fascinated with uh, with with the, the the craft of writing and and how it goes on. I've always been fascinated with Hemingway and Hemingway had this thing that he just turned up and was able to write. His first ever editor said the 17 year old kid in the Kansas City Star could write. 
where are you on that spectrum or how would you see yourself? Are you kind of like a natural talent in writing or do you work on your writing? Well, it's funny, you always think you're at the peak of your abilities, you know, like everybody always thinks that. And I remember when I was um, 18, in fact, even younger, when I was 13, I was sending in uh, submissions to New York and um, I've still got some of them because I made photocopies of them. And they're okay, you know, they're not really publishable. But I remember at the time thinking, yeah, I won't have to study for my O levels. I'm going to be a professional writer by by the time I'm 13, and and uh, and you look at it and it's kind of clunky now and everything. And then when I sold my first thing when I was 18 and I was writing professionally by 19, I was actually making a pretty decent living by 19 quite quickly. I remember at the time thinking, yeah, I should I should be doing all the the big books and all that. But really, with any kind of hindsight, you know, and, and any honesty with yourself, you realise what you're doing isn't great. But your enthusiasm is great, you know, um, but you, you sort of look at it and you think, no, I haven't quite learned my craft yet, you know. Um, so I, I would say I was about 28, from, from 18, 19, I was about 28 of doing it full time every day for those 10 years before it really started to come together for me. And, and what I did for those first 10 years is do what, what everybody does. It's the equivalent of bashing your thumb with a hammer, isn't it? You know, you're, you're just learning your, your, your craft and how to... Your influences are so obvious. I think the first few years, all your influences are there. You're, you're writing like other people instead of yourself. But then I think you find your own voice after doing it. Is that 10,000 hours thing that people talk about? Um, yeah. I think it's, it's essential. I mean, I was lucky that most people's 10,000 hours are rejections, so people don't see you learning. Um, whereas I was in an industry that actually was growing so fast, they were taking guys who weren't even ready yet, like me. So all of my learning was done in public. So it can be a little embarrassing when you look back, some of it looks clunky, but there's some good stuff in there as well, you know, and you can never be ashamed of what you've written because it's all part of the journey, isn't it? And the thing you like least is always the thing somebody likes best too, so it's, it's all good. That's right, it's that weird moment when somebody likes something that you weren't rating in, in yourself. Oh, weird, yeah, really. And so it that, can be annoying sometimes as well, you know, because you, you, sometimes you'll see, you know, like big sales or something on a book, and you're like, wow. Yeah, that one didn't work at all you know you just you can't quite figure it out you know and sometimes the ones you like best are the ones that, that that don't hit as big but that's just all part of it as well you know you just got to write what you you enjoy and feel like doing yeah absolutely and i'm just thinking about that actual process just drill down a little bit you're looking at something um you know you're back back to your 20s wouldn't it be nice to just get a, a time machine and go back to your 20s and you're you're sitting in your garret and uh, you know you're, you're 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 feeling pretty pretty good about um your work because you, you're getting paid to, mm -hmm. to do your work. What, what, what kind of things were you, were you doing when you were looking back and revising uh, and looking at rejections and, and, and looking at the things that were working and trying, what, 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 what was the process you were going through then? I think I was doing what everybody does, which is um, I couldn't understand why everything wasn't selling. You know, maybe half my stuff was selling and the other half was being rejected. Um, and, but that was enough to keep me afloat. I was actually doing okay. Um, but I, I remember uh, it was like doggy paddling though, like my head was just above the water for most of it. And I was always just trying to avoid working, like actually having a job. You know, that was my big motivation in my twenties to actually never have a job and be one of those guys that just kick around all day, you know, which I somehow managed to do. Um, but I, I would write during the day and then just go out at nighttime or meet up with my pals in town and things like that, you know? So, I mean, my twenties were just really good fun. And when I think back, I think in some ways it would have been a, a horrible mistake to have hit it big at 21 or 22 because I'd have been working too hard, I think. I think I was I was just kind of enjoying it. And maybe I wouldn't have had any to write about at 30 if I'd just uh, been sitting at a computer all that time. Um, but I think that that process is really important and, and understanding what works and what doesn't and seeing what audiences respond to. But, but I think the big thing I learned that completely changed the way I write um, was when I almost gave up which was in my late twenties, I was going to work in television. I sent a submission in cold into channel four and I, I was amazed they bought it. You know, I mean, I literally just wrote a thing and put channel four London and sent a submission. I didn't know anyone or anything and they, and they bought it, which was awesome. And I still hadn't really cracked it in comics. I was 30 before that happened. Um, and what I did as a kind of goodbye project to comics was to write something that I would really want to read. And the, the biggest thing that I would tell anybody who's writing is to do that which is to not anticipate trends, which I spent my whole twenties doing. I would actually look at sales and think, oh, maybe I should do something more like this. You know, you know the way all these kind of rubbishy sub Harry Potter kind of books yes. look at Harry Potter and think, oh, well, what children really want is wizards at boarding school. I should do something 
a bit like that. Whereas what made Harry Potter really good was there was nothing else like that in the market, you know? And, right. and she just did something, Joe Rowling just did something she wanted to write. And that was my big thing. I just wrote something I wanted to write. And then enthusiasm is infectious and by osmosis, other people seem to be into that stuff too. And, and it just took off. And, and my, my life changed overnight. It literally changed in March 20, 2000 um, because I was suddenly doing stuff for me instead of for this invisible audience. Yeah, and, and, and that taps in also to the fearfulness, I guess, just still focusing for a moment on the craft of writing. I think when you're a new writer, there's a, there's a fear, there's a fear that, of, 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 there's almost like fear of words, you know, there's a fear of getting things on the page, fear of what people think, how people think of you, what they, you know, caring maybe too much about perceptions around you. Did, yeah. did you find that at that point? Actually, probably less so then because um, this was pre-internet, you know, so, so the 1990s where I was breaking in, I assumed everybody was loving it, right? And then it was only whenever I was in the office in London for the magazine I was working for, I saw some letters and people were saying, this guy's terrible, you know? And, and I was like, oh my God, you know? Whereas now people automatically with, within, like the shops open at 9 a.m. and by 10 past nine, there's somebody criticizing you, you know, on Twitter. So, like, so, so you can tell pretty quickly, you know, what people think of something. But strangely, the, the audience before people went online, you know, before about 1990, Eight, when everybody was online, 97, 98. Prior yeah. to that, you just hoped for the best. You wrote your stories and it was like putting a message in a bottle and sending it off to the sea. Whereas now, now everyone tells you immediately what they think. And everyone's a critic as well. Well, it can be great though as well. It is quite addictive as well, you know, because it is lovely when something's out for say, of all these people in Buenos Aires or something saying, oh my God, this is my favorite thing. But at the same time, you're going to hear people saying this is the worst thing I've ever read. So you, you believe people are a genius when they say you're a genius, you'll believe them when they say you're terrible, you know, so you, you have to just have some distance from it. Yeah, that, that's good. And just finishing off on the writing, I suppose you talked about the moment pre and post Netflix. And I'm just wondering when you were still doing the, 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 the graphic novels and the, and the, and the comic books, um, were you thinking cinematically when you were doing them or were you thinking about comics? What was, what was, what, what was in, going on in your mind as you were writing that? I didn't think of either. I, I literally just thought of the stories, you know? So, but it's a bit like my style is quite cinematic. Um, so my, my, my style doesn't look like the Bruins. It looks like a Marvel movie, you know, it just it has that look. In the same way that if somebody's a painter or an artist, they can be somebody who who draws in a cartoony style or they've got a photorealistic style, you know? So um, so my, my style of writing is quite like a movie. And Stan Lee said that to me. He said it to me when I was working at Marvel um, very early on and he'd just read a Spider-Man thing I'd done. And uh, he said this, he said, I don't feel I'm reading a comic, I feel I'm reading a movie. And I think that's maybe why Hollywood guys sort of zeroed in on me a little bit because it felt very mainstream the way I was working. And, uh, and they seemed quite excited by that, the kind of things that I did just felt like the movie was already on the page. It was, it was quite an easy translation. The comic almost like a storyboard sort of thing. It was just, just there. And it was never planned that way. It's just that for me, a story's a story, you know, and, and, and stories have a certain structure. And I'm informed in a lot of structure from film, uh, maybe more than comic, because I probably watch more movies than I spend time reading comics. Um, so, so I think I naturally pick up the, the tricks of, of a screenplay maybe more than I, I do comics. But it's great for, for work because I mean, what I do now is mainly the, the, the live action side of things and reverse engineer it into comics, like I say. Um, so it, actually my job feels much the same, whether it's actors or drawings. Great stuff. What about getting into it? You talk about this moment when you got into it and there was a bit of maybe serendipity about where you were and what you were doing and, 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 and the way the whole business was going at, at that point. Have you got any tips for, uh, for the audience about uh, how to get into it? Imagine you're, just coming to the end of your MA TV fiction writing, and you know you're, you're thinking, well, you know, how do I how do I get there? How do I how do I make those kind of leaps? Well, it's funny. The big thing that I remember when I was 13, 14, 15, sending submissions out to New York, is that I would send a script, and then I worked out how many days it took to get there, and then I would figure out roughly what time it was with a five hour difference to New York, and when I should phone them and see if they've read it yet. Right? I mean, it was crazy. But what yeah. I did was, I, I remember sending something off on a Thursday and thinking, okay, they'll have that on Tuesday. So by the time I come home from school at four o'clock, that'll be about 11 a.m. their time. So they probably won't have read it yet, you know, which is nuts, right? I mean, this is some, an unsolicited submission on a desk. And uh, I thought, so I'll have my dinner. That'll probably be their lunch break. 
and I'll maybe phone them about 7 p.m. my time and they'll have read my story and they'll want to buy it. Right, so I was going to, like, you know those crazy X Factor guys that, that say, oh, I, I want to be working with Beyonce next year and everything, you know? Yeah. And so I was kind of like that. I just assumed when I was 13 that they were just going to buy, buy my stuff, you know? Um, and the one thing I've really realized is from, from phoning up and hoping they've read my story is that their day is so packed, you know, like the time to read a script is actually almost non-existent in your working day. These guys, if they are reading unsolicited stuff, they're reading it at nighttime, but realistically, they're probably not reading it at all. Because, I mean, I'll give you a quick example with me. Like this week, I'm, I'm working 14 hour days this week and I've got two screenplays that people have given me who are friends who said, you should have a look at the screenplay. But I've got three screenplays from my own division at Netflix that I haven't read and they've been on my desk for two weeks because I haven't the time to even go back and read the stuff I'm supposed to do for work, you know, because I'm busy doing promotional stuff for the show we've got next month and prepping a new show we're shooting soon and everything. Um, mm -hmm. and, and looking at, I'm interviewing showrunners and interviewing directors and everything. So the weird thing is people have got so much less time than you think to, to read a script. And my really practical advice I would say to everybody is try and make something. Because if you can do something short that people can watch in five minutes, you have much more chance of people assessing how good you are than a telephone size, the telephone directory size document landing on the desk. Like there's an excellent chance they won't read it, an excellent chance. Um, and then the idea of them giving you notes on it and you coming back with a revised version and everything is, is really difficult. So what I would suggest to everyone is make a short film. If, if, sorry, if that's if it's film you want to go into, if it's comic books, make a comic book team up with an artist. If it's, if it's film or television, try and make a really clever three or four minute short film. Because I know people whose careers have begun when they put up a four minute short film on YouTube and people are like, this guy's awesome, you know, and they hire him and they get him doing something else. You know, you start small and build up, but something that people can watch while they're having a cup of tea is perfect. And there's always people around, there's loads of actors and directors and things around. Team up with people at the same stage you are in your career and, uh, and get it up online for free. And when you become a little internet phenomenon, you could have a deal by the end of that week. Yeah, that's good advice. Good advice about YouTube as well. Um, fantastic, good. Um, let's uh, think a, a, um, a little bit about some of the, um, uh, the, the bigger issues that are happening at the moment. The pandemic, would you make a pandemic movie? <laughs> <laughs> I think you know, it's kind of like, you know, after the war, like from 1939 to 1945, if you've been living the war, it's oh. horrible to watch a film about the war in 1946, you know, and I feel a bit like that with the pandemic. <laughs> if I see Batman wearing a mask that isn't just the top half of his face, if I see him wearing a mask in the bottom half of his face, it's too bleak, isn't it, you know? So I don't know. I mean, I think um, I'm fascinated by what follows bad news, you know, in terms of entertainment. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting that superheroes have been hugely popular. Um, in World War II, in the Cold War, uh, when there's a potential nuclear strike and everything, you know, and, and uh, financial recessions. Whenever things are bad, superheroes are huge. And we've had a combination, weirdly, the in the last 20 years of financial crashes and, um, and almost a permanent state of war and terror. Um, so that's really interesting, you know, that whenever things are tough, people want something a bit lighter. So I, I think we couldn't handle a pandemic movie in these times, you know, what, what, what I, what I think is going to be huge next, superheroes obviously I think have got another 10 plus years in them because we're, we're too high right now to disappear. Like things go like that usually in a parabolic curve. They don't go like that and just disappear. So yeah. there's too many good ones have been made over the last 20 years for this to just fall off a cliff. There'll, there'll be a, at worst a gradual decline, you know? So I think feel good movies like superheroes, musicals I think will be huge comedies I think will be good I mean what people really want to see now I think is big wide outdoor spaces and people having a good time I reckon that I, I, I'd be making those kind of pictures yeah a, a comedy in a wood or something like that yeah um, people and, 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 seeing people getting off with each other will be weird again you know it's like nobody's even been able to hug for the last <laughs> Absolutely. So it, 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 in, in terms of uh, the, the need for a superhero, you, you touched on that there. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I was, what, what, is the, what is that What is that need uh, on, on a personal level with people, do you think? You know, there's that whole thing about, is, is it to do with people's feeling of helplessness around things? Do you know that the idea that there might be, uh, that there might be somebody out there in a cape 
who's able to come in and, and fix their problems or protect them? What's, 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 the, what's, the, what's the attraction that way? It's the basis of everything. It's the basis of all religion. You know, everybody looks to the sky for somebody to save them whenever things are tough. You know, you don't see that many people on their knees praying, you know, when, when everything's good. It's, it's, it's whenever things are bad, people do this, you know. Um, and, and likewise, I think it's the same when people turn to nationalism as well. You know, like whenever times are tough, people turn to extreme solutions. Um, and we see it going all the way back 5,000 years that we know of, you know, probably even 11,000 years, you know, probably to, to Sumerian times. We have these stories about people who come from the sky and help us out and and it never goes away and weirdly they've all got very similar archetypes you know there's usually a strong one a guy who can move quickly you know uh, the, somebody who lives in the sea you know there's all these kind of archetypes whether it's aquaman going back through neptune and poseidon or you know apollo samson and superman or whatever you know these archetypes go back thousands of years and people just seem to need them and I think if, if you're having a tough time 5,000 years ago in ancient Greece, you know, to hear about these guys who live in Mount Olympus is quite exciting and takes you away from the world uh, that you're in for the moment. You know, if, if, if you're a slave in ancient Egypt, it's really interesting to hear about Horus and all, all those kind of guys. So, uh, so I think um, we're just the modern equivalent of that now. And if it gets people through tough times, fantastic. You know, it's like a wee couple of hours when you can escape. That's great. And um, just... Um, one last kind of like question in, in, in this section, and I suppose it's kind of like, uh, it's just to think about um, how comic books deal with things like violence uh, and, you know, societal positions, you know, so, you know, um, the, the role of women, etc. I mean, you've had some pretty strong female characters that you've produced over the, over, over the, uh, over the years, uh, you know, I'm thinking of Hit Girl and things like that. So, you know, how, how to what extent do uh, comic books talk to society or society talks to comic what, what what what's the conversation that's going on there it's a symbiosis isn't it you know i mean I, i'm always fascinated by the fact that um like quentin tarantino and francis capola both say this that like gangsters started behaving like the way gangsters appeared in their movies even though they, their gangsters were fictional you know in godfather and reservoir dogs these yeah. guys exist, but real life gangsters who these guys were based on started to emulate the way these guys were and they started to dress kind of like them and talk about like them and act like them. And I always think that's really fascinating, you know? So, so I think that one always informs the other. So, you know, my, my work is all influenced by what I see and other people's work. Um, and, and then that creeps into the real world, I guess, and then comes back to you too, because I see other people's work and cinemas sometimes five years after one of my things, and I can see little things they've, they've taken yes. from it, been influenced yeah. by, and then it comes back, and then I'm informed by that again, you know? So, so we all exist in a big cultural melting pot, which is, which is really interesting, and that's, that's how it grows. I mean, every one of my things I can trace back to something I loved when I was a kid, um, yeah. you know, whether it's Superman or Star Wars or Flash Gordon or Indiana Jones, I can draw a line through them straight to, to my stuff. Um, and I think, I think that's what we do as writers, really, isn't it? You know, everything that's been put in our heads, we we shake it up a little bit and then we put it out in hopefully a fresh form. Um, but that's what make, that's what makes it really exciting, you know. Because if you if you can find something you love and then translate it for a twenty first century environment, so yeah. other people can love it again, it's it's a wonderful thing. Highest form of flattery and all that as well. Yeah, exactly. And um, just touching one last thing before we go into Q and A and and and, and the, the quick fire round, as it were. Uh, um, what what's the position? Uh, of, that you have in relation to sustainability. So, you know, at GCU, we care about this a lot, where, where, where we are signatories of the UN's Sustainable Development Goals and uh, our MATV fiction writing and our, our BA in media comms, uh, we're, we're the only university in, in Scotland that's signed up to BAFTA, Albert. Um, and, you know, we're, we're trying to find ways as a, as a university to find sustainable ways in all sorts of industries, but particularly in the, in the screen industries as well. And, and, and do you see any changes coming afoot, you know, in Hollywood? Are Hollywood thinking about these things yet? Or, or, or is it still high in the sky? Do you mean like a, an ecological thing? Yes, yes, that sustainable, sustainable production, uh, uh, using sustainability in, 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 um, in, in scripts and in, in films. Is there any kind of like, any, any sign of that happening? Uh, I don't. I don't think so. No. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll have to. It never crosses my mind, you know. Like oh, I mean, right. I'm just always thinking of what's like. 
you know, I mean, I, I wrote a scene quite recently where I had a bunch of sharks being shot underwater, you know, and like, <laughs> <laughs> and maybe not many ask, but I, I, I contacted a, a friend of mine who would know these things. And I said, how far can, what, what, what kind of machine gun can do enough damage underwater that it can take out six sharks, you know? So, I mean, these, these questions I tend to ask myself, you know. So. <laughs> Well, you'll have to come and join us on our BAFTA Sustainability <laughs> Program. Mark. I'll get you signed up. <laughs> Good stuff. That's absolutely brilliant. I, I, I've really enjoyed that. Um, I hope I hope that you uh, you got something out of it too, Mark. So oh, what we're going to do? But sorry, go on. I was just going to say it's great getting away from the family for an hour, actually, because uh, <laughs> we get to the homework. You know, so. <laughs> great stuff. Um, so what we'll do is uh, we're going to uh, just um, start a little bit with some of the. Uh, uh, the the the, the, um, qu the pre questions that we had. So if you just bear with me a little second, I'll I'll get some of these up. Um, I mean the obvious one. One of our um, one of our um, MATV scriptwriters is asking the the obvious questions. How on earth can we sit, uh, submit a, a TV series to Netflix? <laughs> I don't know if you're able to answer that in this forum, but uh, we'll ask yeah, it anyway. I I'd refer back to what I said earlier, which is I would I would create a brilliant four minute film, you know, like, or the alternative route is the much longer way of doing it, which is start really small, like in BBC Scotland or something like that, or, or like, a, you know, the stage, like a, a stage production and, yeah. uh, and just build up. I mean, that's, that's the traditional way of doing it. And then you go from there to BBC England, then you go from there up to sort of independent film in Hollywood and work your way up. But, but I, I think one of the beautiful things about the 21st century is that you can be found much quicker than you used to be. You can find an international audience really, really fast. So if you do something really cool, then people come looking for you because uh, nobody's, like I say, nobody's got time to read scripts, but everybody loves a little short film that's awesome. So if, if you can get that out there and get people excited about it, then you get people maybe taking a wee bit of a risk on you. Like Netflix is, it's kind of like when I started in comics, I remember thinking, I should be writing X-Men. X-Men was the number one book, right? And it was at one point sold 8 million copies back in the, every month in the 1990s. Um, it was doing really, really well. And I was like, oh, I should be doing that. But the weird thing is, it's really hard to start at that level. You know, you, can, uh, you, you have to do some work for free first. You have to sort of hone your craft a little bit. Um, so, so, you know, sometimes don't want to get into Netflix too soon. You know, for me, this is... God, when I sold my company to Netflix, that was 26 years into my career. Mm -hmm. So I was coming with a certain amount of experience. Like I know my way around a, a screenplay. I know my way around a film. <clears throat> I mean, that's since October until two weeks ago, I sat with eight hours of television, like my first Netflix drama, you know, which is one of the most expensive pieces of telly ever made and everything, you know, and I, I, I sat, but I knew exactly what I was doing when I was to, starting to chip away at little bits and tweak a line here or move things around. And I was sitting with the team just figuring out what we wanted to do, but you, you, you don't know that right away. You know, sometimes you need to do 20, 25 years before you really understand the craft of all that stuff. Um, yeah. So, so what, what I would say is start small. It's like when you're weightlifting, you don't start with 500 pounds, you know, start, start with 20 pound weights and, and build up. Good. From the live audience, I have a question here. Been a lot of questions, actually pre-questions as well about Nemesis. Okay, mm -hmm. we'll come to Nemesis in a minute. A question from Mike, Mike Gorman, saying, uh, are you considering adaptations of Jupiter's Legacy, uh, Circle, uh, or any of these projects from that, or are you starting from a clean slate? Well, also a big fan of Nemesis, and wants an update on book number two, please. Right. Well, Jupiter's Legacy, that's, clearly we need to up this marketing, because we, we released the trailer yesterday. For, for that's right, I was going to say, I saw the trailer for it <laughs> um, last night. Be on my Twitter page. Tell me, check out my Twitter page, where else? Mike, like, if you're yeah. listening... <laughs> Go online, it's all over the place. <laughs> but it actually has worked out really great. You know, I'm really, really happy with it. And, uh, you know, the, God, the deals were starting to get put together um, for the writers on that back in 2018. You know, so it's, I mean, it's a big, big drama. It'll hopefully run for maybe four seasons or so. Um, it's fantastic. The whole story. So, so we had to just plan all this stuff out so far ahead and then took 16 weeks to shoot and everything, you know, and then there was a year of editing and you've worked COVID into all that kind of stuff. It was crazy. All the special effects getting added. So we finally put it to bed about two weeks ago um, and it's coming out on May the 7th, which is our wedding anniversary. So, um, you know, that was that was a pretty lucky day for me. So like, uh, I'm hoping that uh, it works out pretty good. It's our first big Netflix project. So fingers crossed, it's as big as we hope. Great stuff. Uh, and now I've got another question from Catalina Nieto, who's one of the, our media and communications students. 
Um, what, what's the hardest part about producing a movie? What's the most difficult element of it? Um, producing, I, I, I love producing, you know, I'm, I'm really excited by it. Like, uh, I, I think for, for most people, it's getting the money together. That's the, the hardest thing, because you have to say to somebody, I need a hundred million dollars and you could get 200 million back or whatever, you know? So, I mean, that's a bit, like, we're lucky that something like Kick-Ass cost $28 million and they made a hundred back in cinemas and then 240 million by the time you added up DVD and everything. So then there's yeah. a, a trust. You know, and the people think, well, you, I could probably loan you this money because it's essentially a bank loan. You know, so Kingsman cost eighty-one million dollars and made back four hundred and twenty-three million, I think, the first one. So, so the returns are good. And then that meant Netflix thinks, well, this is a guy; it's safe to put money into the projects. It will probably reach a certain number of people. Um, and and it's getting that. You know, again, you have to start small. You have to start at the lower end of that, like going for a bank loan. If you go into the bank. When you're 18 and say I, I'd like 100 million dollars, please. You know you have no chance. But if you say I could borrow 150 pounds, then you have a fair chance of you. And then the, you build up a, a level of trust. Um, but what was a different thing now is what I do is is creative producing um, because I'm on staff at Netflix. I'm an executive at Netflix. I run the Miller World department, and um, what we have is the money's already sitting there. Like Netflix have got the bank of money, but what we do is we figure out okay. What project has got the most mainstream appeal internationally? Because Netflix obviously is in all but four countries in the world, you know, so you can't just be doing American domestic stuff. It's got to be something that appeals in South Korea or Japan or whatever as well. Um, and also who's the best person to bring that story as a director to the screen? So we interview lots of different directors. Um, we, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll usually interview about three writers, three screenwriters, and then pick the best one, the one that's going to work, work out best. Then we work with the directors and everything, selecting the cast. And, you know, that whole process um, is months and months before even a, a camera starts rolling. Uh, but that's, I love it. I mean, that's the stuff I, I find really exciting. Um, and as time goes on, you get quite good at it because you know who's crazy, you know who's reliable you know, who's going to do a good job or who's going to be into this particular genre and everything. And, and that's, that's what makes every day really exciting in this job because every day is different. You know, you're, 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 like the project I'm just about to start working on, I've never worked with any of these guys before. So I've been phoning around people who have worked with them to kind of get their reputations and if we can count on them and everything, you know. So, um, so the producing side of it is as fun as the, the writing. And I quite like, you know, what's really cool about it is you actually get to mix with people. Because as a writer, it's quite a solo thing. You know, you're just sitting at your computer all the time. But there's something quite nice about sitting in meetings, even if it's just Zoom calls just now. But like, uh, it's quite nice just like actually having a wee chat and hopefully coming up with something good when four or five of you put your heads together. Great stuff. I've got a question for somebody because I like his name, Alistair McLean. That's a real writer's name, isn't it? <laughs> Hello, Alistair. Uh, hopefully you're there. You, you submitted a, a, a pre-question. It's, 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 it's this. Are, are you happy with the screen ad adaptations of your work? Oh, delighted. Absolutely delighted, yeah. I mean, I've been very lucky, though, because I've seen friends have horrible experiences. You know, like, there's friends of mine, um, you, you know, heroes of mine growing up, like Alan Moore or Frank Miller or whatever, um, they created some of the greatest comic books ever made but they were born 20 years earlier. So they didn't navigate the Hollywood waters in quite the same way because it was also new then, you know, we had to see what happened to them before we realized it's very important to be producers on your own projects and so on. So, so I go in with the JK Rowling approach and just kind of say, well, I want to have control over this. So whenever a script comes back, I can, even before Netflix, I, can, I was able to work with people who I can talk to about it and give notes if there was anything wrong. But I was also very lucky to generally be working with brilliant people like Matthew Vaughan, Jane Goldman, Chris Morgan on Wanted and everything, you know, so uh, terrific writers. And now I select the writers and what I do is I uh, help shape the screenplays. Like I've got, I mean, there must be half a dozen screenplays this year that I've just been bouncing back to the writers over the last two years that I've just been bouncing back to the writers with loads of notes and then maybe moving it on from those writers and putting it with other screenwriters and so on. So it generally now doesn't end up going in front of a camera unless I'm delighted with it. Good stuff. We're going to do a quick fire round now. Are you ready for it? Okay. It's either yes, no, or short answers for this one. So we can get as many questions in as possible. These are kind of questions that maybe multiple people have tried to uh, put in for you. Are you ready for it? The first one's from Daniel Spelling. And it is, uh, what's, the favorite pro what's your favorite project that you've worked on? Jupiter's Legacy, out in May the 7th. 
A favorite genre of film from Nicholas uh, Scrugel? Superheroes. Um, from Sam McVeigh, who's the biggest inspiration in your career? Oh, um, Stan Lee when I was a kid, Alan Moore and Frank Miller when I was an adult. Good stuff. Uh, one from Daniel um, Donnelly. Uh, how do you handle rejection? A short answer. Uh, do you know, this, this is going to sound so awful, but I luckily don't have to now, you know, but, but I had enough of it in my 20s. You know, that I, I, it wouldn't bother me, you know, like weirdly, I, it, you get so tough uh, being rejected so many times in your 20s that you get wings of steel eventually. <laughs> like super, it's your superhero's uh, power, isn't it? Which we'll come into in a minute. Um, can you recount one quick lesson from your early days? This is from Kevin Mooney that, that, that you sticks that, that you still, you know, adhere to. A lesson from your, from your past, which you still kind of like. Like from, from school or? Oh, no, from, from, from your career, probably. Oh, right. Work with yeah. people you like. That was Stan Lee's advice to me. Always work with people you like and then you'll enjoy getting in. Great. Uh, the one from Amy Alston, you've kind of touched on this one already, but it's okay. The moment you realised you were a writer? Uh, I think I never imagined not be. Yeah, okay. Uh, and one last one uh, from uh, um, Osman Rafiq. Uh, give me one superpower that you would like. What would it be? Do you know, that's probably the most common question I get answered at dress junkets and everything. And I've never come up with a good answer. I've actually never come up with a good one. Um, so I, whoa, what superpower would I like? Uh, see, the, I think I wouldn't like any because I think if I had superpowers, I'd feel I had to go out and be a superhero. Like I'd feel bad just sitting in the house watching TV when I could stop accidents and things like that. <laughs> so, but I, was, I quite like the lack of responsibility that comes with just being an ordinary guy. I quite like that. Yeah. I'd rather somebody else had superpowers and they took care of all this stuff. You could be TV viewing man. man yeah. <laughs> yeah, in a lounge, in loungewear. <laughs> Good. I've got another one from the live audience uh, for, for you, Mark. Uh, and this is one from Sean Langdon. Hello, Sean. It just says, uh, as a writer and someone in the public's eye, do you feel a responsibility to convey positive messages, ideologies through your work? No, I feel the opposite. I absolutely feel the opposite. I mean, the thing that, that always drives me nuts when I'm reading a story or watching a TV show is when I feel the writer's views coming across in the dialogue of the characters. I'm like, and especially if it's more than one character, when I see all the characters agreeing with the writer, I think, no, I, I'll pick up your pamphlet, <laughs> you know, if, if I want it. But I, I think the responsibility of the writer is to entertain. And, uh, and I, I really worry whenever ideology starts creeping into to stories, because what that eventually means is censorship. Because if you actually look at um, just the way things are going, I guess, you know, like people, there's certain subjects that people are afraid to write about, and there, there's certain situations that people are scared, scared to put in stories and everything, you know, like every, you know, some publishing houses are, are saying that they won't publish certain writers and everything. And I think even if that's meant with the best of intentions, um, I think it's very dangerous ground because I think the arts, the most important thing in the arts is freedom, freedom of speech and freedom to write what you want to write and the audience decides whether they're going to buy it or not. But I, I do worry when I see writers being associated with the ideology of their characters. A perfect example is Brett Easton Ellis or somebody, you know, or, or um, you know, Robert Block who wrote Psycho. You know, they've, they've written about people who murder people. That doesn't mean that they condone murder. <laughs> you know, it just means that's that particular story. Their next book could be about something else entirely. So, I, so I, I, I do think it's extremely dodgy, and I see it creeping in more and more. Yeah, I mean Stephen King. You wouldn't, you wouldn't expect that of him either, would you? It's the same thing, isn't it? Which well, brings. I, I love that sometimes the audience they can't figure out my political ide ideology, you know, because some characters I write will be libertarian, some characters I, I write will be green activists or whatever. So I, I remember when I was at Marvel, it used to happen all the time. And I'm a member of the Labour Party on the Corbynista wing of the Labour Party. My politics I've never been shy about, you know, it's always been pretty consistent my whole life. Um, but I've had people really confused, you know, like people online saying, hang on a minute, did you read that line of dialogue that Miller wrote? I had no idea he was right wing. It's like, no, the character's right wing. You know, this is a different <laughs> thing. And it says, the Miller's completely mad. Six pages later, the character seems to be left wing. And it's like, it's a different character, you know. It's like, you know? So I, I don't know. People are very literal when it comes to this stuff. I guess that comes back to the craft of writing, doesn't it? So it becomes back to the whole thing in terms of writing, you know, um, of, of show, not tell. 
So it's almost like you know the the, the super villain who you know starts uh, you know starts starts a line of kind of like the logic you know just at the moment before. Uh, the Invincibles are about to, to, to do them over. But it's, just, yeah. it's the same thing, isn't it, in terms of the craft? Yeah, I think so. And, and I think I'd say most writers I've met are, are quite similar types of people. They broadly believe in the same thing. You know, like Hollywood, um, in terms of actors, writers, directors, I would say it's 90% like me, which is left of centre, you know? So everybody is an empathic personality. I think that um, to be creative, you have to have a certain amount of openness in your personality and to be empathic and understand what it's like to be other people. That's what makes you able to write different characters. So when everybody starts expressing the same viewpoint, it can get a little bit tedious. Um, so I, I quite like the troublemakers. I like the people who come in and shake it up a little bit. Yeah. Um, so in terms of those troublemakers, you make the troublemakers your characters. You know, the, the, the troublemakers become... Uh, you know, you are you are a proxy troublemaker. I accuse you, Mark Miller. Is this is this is this how it, is this how it works? <laughs> well, let's say there's something like Hit Girl or whatever. You know, like Hit Girl's a ten year old girl who knifes people and shoots them, and she swears. You know, would I like to, would I like one of my children to be like that? No, it'd be terrible. But your job as a writer is to write interesting characters and interesting stories. So I think sometimes you should do stuff that that surprises even yourself, and then it'll surprise your audience. Too. Good stuff. Um, another one from the live audience, if that's okay, Mark. This one's from Ross McHattie, who's one of our MATV, MATV fiction writing friends. Uh, where should a screenwriter, um, it, sorry, where should a screenwriter enter into a script or a story, etc.? Um, I, I guess he's meaning. So, so I've, I've kind of lost um, the, the point a little bit there. Sorry, Ross, but I think we're we're talking about you know where should they precisely put. Um, any screen works that they're going to do and there was another question just to help you a little bit um, and I think you've addressed it already but it's important it's that whole thing about do you, do you do you put in a taster of your writing or do you put the whole script in? Write the whole script but I think it's not always helpful to send the whole script like I said because it may not be read. Tarantino did a very clever thing he wrote about four screenplays I think before he made Reservoir Dogs and those were sitting there he banked them he tried to sell them it wasn't working then he made a very low budget film, Reservoir Dogs. Um, mm. And you can make something pretty cheap. I mean, Blair, Blair Witch Project costs nothing, right? The Blair, Blair, Blair Witch Project costs less than your average car to make, and it made three or four hundred million dollars. Um, so you can make things, if you're clever about it, you can make things pretty cheaply. But it's your calling cards. And once you've had that, then your screenplays that you've got sitting on your shelf, then you can sell them. And if you have something that's got a little bit of heat, from the short movie that you make and get up online or whatever, then when people come calling, then they're going to be more likely to read your screenplay. But like I say, sending in a screenplay go, go, cold, you know, it's very difficult. Good. We're getting open, some more questions about some of your characters here. Mm -hmm. uh, one from Stefan, I think it's Stefan Blitz, and it's uh, is Super Crooks animated? And there's a second part. What are the plans for Huck and Starlight? Um, Super Crooks is probably, I think it's the next project out at Netflix. Um, Jupiter's Legacy is the big superhero drama that we have coming out May the 7th and it's about superheroes you know the idea is what if superheroes take over the world kind of thing um, and you know they, they topple presidents and all that kind of stuff what Jupiter's Legacy's companion thing Super Crooks is about is super villains it's kind of about what it's like to be part of a heist in a world with superheroes and costumes and all that kind of stuff so imagine Ocean's Eleven or Goodfellas or something like that you know with with costumes um, and we're doing that as a Japanese anime thing. So our Japanese division um, is working with uh, an amazing Japanese anime company called Studio Bones. Um, and I've been supervising that for the last year or so. Um, it's going to be a 13 part animated series. Um, that should be out. I, I can't give the date, I think, officially, but that'll be our next thing pretty soon. Yeah. And Starlight um, is over at 20th Century Fox, now called Fox. Um, mm -hmm. And that's been made uh, it's in pre production just now. And we have, what was the other Huck? Huck, we're doing oh, uh, yeah, Huck. a guy who did a movie called uh, Hidden Figures, who's a terrific director. He's really good. Oh, yeah. So he's writing and directing um, Huck. Um, we'll hopefully get that film. And now, now that we're all coming out of COVID, all these screenplays that have been sitting for, the, for a little while at the company, we can get moving now because we'd have liked to have been shooting this stuff last summer, but now it'll be this summer probably. Good. I've got one from uh, uh, from Tony Benedetti and Martin. Uh, Tony is one of our PhD students in uh, at Glasgow Cali in, in my department. Uh, she's asking, is the future of superhero movies 
uh, superhero media, media rather, movies or TV, where's it going to end up? You're doing a lot of TV stuff now. Yeah, where's, I've never done TV. Where's it going? Yeah, I think it's both. I mean, it's, it's still going to be both. But like, um, you know, when, when the last big Marvel project that came out was Avengers Endgame, it made $2.7 billion. So they're not they're not going to miss out on these kind of paydays. You know? and, and superhero stuff tends to make a lot of money. You know, it's, I mean, 15 years ago, uh, your typical superhero movie made about 400 million. And now anything shy of a billion can look quite disappointing. And then you've got the crazy stuff that does 2.7 and everything. Um, so I don't think anybody's going to stop that anytime so netflix they'll be entirely um streaming so everything that's coming out from me uh at netflix which is quite a lot probably about 16 different properties um over the next two or three years um that's going to be a combination of film and and series so what i do is i just look at it and think can this story be told in two hours or do i do i need 40 hours to tell this story and jupiter's legacy i need 40 hours to tell the story whereas something like huck i can tell in two hours so I think the trick is just to do what serves the story best. Game of Thrones would have been a really disappointing two-hour movie because they'd have had yeah. to so much. Sometimes you need to let it breathe. Good. I've, I've just lost it, but I can't find it. But I'm going to get, I'm sorry, a lovely question from somebody. Uh, and I've just lost it on this because there's so many questions coming in. Do you live in Dracula's castle? It, do, it does look a bit spooky. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've lost who that was. A very funny one. Oh, it's Ty. It was one from Ty. Do you live in Dracula's house rather than? <laughs> Do you know the house? This is 300 years old. This house is, but it's weirdly not spooky. It looks spooky on Zoom, but this oh. is a room. Like the houses get terrible internet reception. So in my office, I can never get Zoom. So I have to, I have to come up to the dining room and shout at all the kids. I'm like Jack Nicholson in The Shining. I'm like, <laughs> I'm Zoom. You know, I have to I have to come in here and try and make it work. <laughs> oh, good stuff. So, so let's let's just uh, have a little think again about just just um, to go back and uh, revisit some of that other work and, and and your writing. I was really interested with Red Sun, and mm. um, because what you did with Red Sun, and I'm not putting words in your mouth, I see it was almost like having a counter narrative around Superman, mm. um, which enabled you to say quite a lot about the state of the world and the state of the world in the in the last hundred odd years. So, yeah, talk us through. How you came up with that creative process? Did you did you were you sitting there looking at a Superman comic, thinking, "Wow, wouldn't it be interesting if that fellow was on the other side?" What was what, what happened with the process there? I did a really easy trick actually, and what can be really interesting is just to reverse an idea, take something that people are used to and flip it. So, for example, I created a thing called Nemesis. It was a movie I was going to do with Tony Scott about ten years ago, um, and it's at Warner Brothers, I think. Yeah. But um, the idea with that was. What if instead of Batman being a good guy, Batman's like the Joker, Batman's the city's worst nightmare, and the cops every night have to go out and get this masked billionaire who's got all this technology and everything, and he's robbing banks, and it's Commissioner Gordon up against the evil Batman, right? That's such a simple idea. You just flip it and people get it because they're so familiar with the original idea. And similarly, Red Sun was the same. Red Sun, I, uh, I, I took an archetype, which ev everybody in the world knows. I mean, Superman, probably the world's most famous fictional character. Um, and I think uh, it was easy instead of him landing in America. The idea was his rocket was hours later and ran, lands in Russia. The world has turned a little bit. The idea I actually got from a book when I was six. And when I was six, I, um, I read the Superman comic that was kind of, it, it had Superman's rocket land in uh, neutral waters. And the Americans and the Russians were both heading towards it. And the Americans got there first. And the idea came from me then. And it was, uh, you know, what if the Russians had got there first? And the story wrote itself because you think if if Superman's rocket had landed, you know, in the early part of the 20th century and he grew up on a collective farm and he was Stalin's, you know, top guy and everything, you know, even Stalin, uh, you know, his name means man of steel, which is good Superman connotations. The whole thing just seemed to, to write itself. And the idea then that if the person who wins the Cold War or the country that wins the Cold War is, is Russia and uh, the Soviet Union instead of uh, instead of the US. What does that mean for the US? Do the, do the states start to fragment? You know, the 50 states fall apart the way that the Soviet bloc disintegrated. So the whole story, I mean, it, before I even started writing it, it was almost there for me. It was, it was great and really easy. <laughs> Good stuff. Now we've only got like a, a couple of minutes left. Is there anything you else you'd like to cover or say or anything that uh, you'd like to just finish off and uh, uh, with, 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 with some words of wisdom or maybe some words of silliness? I don't know, whatever you want to do. 
I, I think, I mean, like I say, if I have to give any advice to anybody, do as short a thing as possible that reaches as many people as you can. Work with people you like. Never work with anybody who's not nice. Because even if you think it's a good career move, it's not. Always hang about with people who you like and work with people you like. You'll get the best out of yourself and do the best work. Um, always think of an international audience. This is so important for Scottish creatives. It's crazy the number of people who, who tell me, oh, yeah, I've been writing this movie set in Sucky Hall Street. And I'm like, that means nothing to anybody, even in Stirling. Like, nobody's going to understand this at all, you know? Like, think globally. Like, when you come up with something, like, you know, in the past, Carnegie and all these guys, all these, like, Scottish entrepreneurs 100 years ago, 150 years ago, they thought about the world. They, thought, they didn't think about just selling in their hometown. You know, they thought about the, the global environment. And I think that is, is critical. If you're going to come up with an idea, try and make it something universal that everybody will understand. So that if you're in India or you're in China or whatever, it means as much to you as if you're in, you know, Pollock. Yeah, it's, it's the universal aspects of life, but also universal aspects of storytelling in that sense. You can set your thing somewhere else, you know, that you'll be surprised. And sometimes you get a wee bit more out of it by setting it somewhere else as well, because it makes you think a different way from the way you normally think. The dialogue can be a wee bit more interesting because it's not your normal colloquial tongue that you're writing with. So I, I would always say to all young Scottish media people, think global, think big. Mark Miller, you have been an absolute star and, uh, and great company as well. I've really enjoyed talking to you. Uh, you're great. <laughs> There's nobody else here, uh, yeah. and uh, it's been uh, it's, it's been great. You're a great friend of GCU, and we really always appreciate your involvement and and taking the time to to talk to the students. And maybe we can have you back when the pandemic's over, and yeah. you'll get overrun yeah. by by COVID-ridden students asking you to sign their comics. Oh, listen, I can't wait to get back and do talks again. Like actually, in front of a crowd, it'd be so lovely, wouldn't it? You know, like I, I do miss conventions and book signings and all that you know like uh, it's that's the one thing I think we're all missing because it's it's such a nice thing when you, as a writer to see the people who are enjoying it you know good Mark thanks you so much once again and uh, we'll hopefully see you back at uh, Glasgow Cali at some point Anytime. all the best then Good stuff take care Later, then. bye